Javed Iqbal was a Pakistani serial killer, paedophile and child rapist who claimed to have killed 100 boys in a 12 month period between 1998 and 1999. He strangled his victims and then dissolved their bodies in acid. His self-proclaimed kill count makes him one of the most prolific serial killers in history and whilst there are some doubts about his number of victims, it's clear he ended the lives of many children and was proud of his crimes. Welcome to Evil Among Us. Most sources state that Javed Iqbal was born in 1956 in Lahore, the second largest city in Pakistan, but other years of birth mentioned include 1961. He was the sixth of eight children to his businessman father Muhammad, and the family, who observed the Muslim faith, was quite well off. Iqbal showed violent, self-entitled and manipulative behaviour as a child, with one of his brothers stating, quote, As a boy, he was violent and eccentric. He would give a lot of headache to our parents. Another brother said that if his parents ever refused his demands, he would threaten to hurt himself until he got what he wanted. Iqbal himself said that during his childhood, he first began having fantasies about killing people. As a young man, Iqbal was described as arrogant, an individual consumed with his own self-importance, and he would regularly boast about his alleged ties to politicians and other famous people in Pakistan. He was desperate to give people the impression that he was part of high society and therefore better than them. Iqbal knew he was gay from a young age, something his conservative Muslim family refused to acknowledge, but it appears this was a well-known secret. Iqbal's feelings of rejection and anger about not being able to openly indulge his sexual interest in males built up inside of him and his resentment against society began to fester. Iqbal did marry twice in his life, even having a daughter, but it appears that these marriages were to stop rumours about his behaviour from spreading. However, when he got to his 20s, it became clear that Iqbal was not interested in men, but little boys, and he would go to great lengths in order to find victims. This was a time well before the internet, and people used adverts in magazines and newspapers in order to find people to speak to, to find pen pals, and Iqbal was one of these individuals. He put adverts in the Altair magazine, specifically stating he wanted to talk to people. It's not clear what his advert slash advert specifically said, but it was like they were geared towards ensuring that the majority of those writing to him were children. I believe on one occasion, he said he wanted someone to write to about collecting stamps. Those children who did write to him would receive letters written in colourful pens, clearly to make them more attractive to a child. Iqbal would send money to the children in his letters in exchange for photographs of them, but also asking them to meet him. Whilst it was only a small amount of money, it was likely more than these children had ever seen, and many of them went to his property unaccompanied and were molested by Iqbal. In the neighbourhood where he lived, he quickly gained a reputation as a paedophile, and parents would keep their children as far away from him as possible, but this did not stop Iqbal from luring children from outside of the immediate area. A man who lived in the area said, quote, It was an open secret. Everyone knew he molested young boys. Iqbal's family received numerous complaints about his paedophilia, but they were able to pay the families off. This seems to have emboldened Iqbal, and he became more brazen. In 1990, he lured a nine-year-old boy off the streets into his home and raped him. The boy's parents called the police and filed a report, and he was arrested for sodomy. However, Iqbal was able to pay the police off, and the charge was dropped. Iqbal then opened an arcade in the early 1990s, which was a magnet for local children. He would spoil them, and an adult who used to go there as a child later stated, quote, He spent lavishly on kids. He would buy us firecrackers. He even built fish aquariums and enclosures for snakes for the entertainment of neighbourhood kids. Children would flock to the arcade day and night, and Iqbal took full advantage of this constant stream of victims. He would drop a 100 rupee note on the floor, which is just under a pound, or just over a dollar in today's money. He would then watch which child picked it up and announce that his money had been stolen. He would then say he needed to search the boys. Once the money had been found on the boy who picked it up, he would be accused of being a thief and told to go with Iqbal into a different room. 
assumedly for punishment or talking to. In this room, the boy would be only raped and often told they could keep the money to buy their silence. Iqbal did this repeatedly. Eventually, word spread amongst the area and parents stopped letting their children go to the arcade. However, Iqbal was undeterred and set up an aquarium, a gym and even a school all with the intention of attracting young boys that he could molest. It's clear that Iqbal was a committed paedophile who would use family money to set up ventures to indulge his deviant sexual interest in little boys. Things got worse in 1993 when his father died and Iqbal received a significant amount of inheritance money. Iqbal would spend lavishly, including building a large house in Rana town in 1995, where he would often be seen with young boys who he would invite over and no doubt molest. Eventually, Iqbal opened another arcade in order to continue to gain access to young boys and to rape them. In February 1998, a report was received from the police that he'd lured two young boys from the Dasa Dabar Shrine in Lahore, taken them to a remote location and raped them at gunpoint. Iqbal was again able to pay the police off and was not charged. On another occasion, Iqbal raped a child from an upper class family the matter was taken to the elders of the area and Iqbal was forced to write a letter saying he wouldn't do it again. And this note was circulated around the area and Iqbal was made to visit about 100 local businesses to apologise as penance for his crimes. However, his luck ran out in September 1998 when Iqbal was beaten severely by two children, including one who worked at the arcade. Iqbal was beaten so badly that he received severe head injuries I was unconscious for 22 days at Lahore General Hospital. Whilst he was unconscious, a child's family made a complaint of rape to the police and, due to not being around to try and bribe his way out of it, when he regained consciousness, he was arrested on a charge of sodomy, but bailed. None of Iqbal's family were willing to pay for his medical treatment, so he had to pay for this out of his own pocket, and he lost his expensive house and cars and was essentially penniless. When he was released from hospital, he had weeks of recovery ahead and was unable to walk properly without assistance. He was forced to move into a run-down property in a slum near the Ravi Road in Lahore and his ageing mother took care of him. I found no real information about his mother, but she and Iqbal were apparently close, but she soon died of a heart attack and Iqbal linked this directly to the stress of the police daring to arrest him for raping children. The death of his mother appears to have been the straw that broke the camel's back and Javed Iqbal decided to get revenge against society by killing a hundred male children. He wanted revenge against the police who would dare to arrest him for raping children and so would show how cunning he was by committing murders right under their noses. He wanted children to be punished because they dared to report his behaviour to the police and also attacked him despite it being highly likely that those who assaulted him with children he'd raped or attempted to rape. However, most of all, he wanted revenge for his mother's death, with him later confessing after his arrest, quote, My mother cried for me. I wanted a hundred mothers to cry for their children. Between approximately December 1998 and December 1999, Javed Iqbal put his sickening plan into action. Javed Iqbal showed a high level of planning in order to commit the murders. He'd apparently continued to fixate on murder throughout his adulthood and had mentioned to others that he felt he could commit the perfect murder by dissolving the bodies of his victims in acid. So Iqbal bought a number of barrels of hydrochloric acid and stored them in his home, which would also be the place where the children would be murdered. Iqbal also had accomplices. He shared his home with three boys, Sajid Ahmad, age 17, Mamad Nadim, age 15, and Mamad Sabir, aged just 13 years old. There was also a fourth accomplice called Muhammad Ishak, but I cannot find any information on him. These boys were so-called street children, those who were orphaned and had no family, or those whose family were extremely impoverished, so their children would take to the streets to try and make money any way they could. This included selling items on the streets, but a terrible profession that some of these, often very young children, were forced into was giving massages to men which would inevitably end with sexual contact. 
Iqbal offered his accomplices money to bring in boys, which enabled them to be able to avoid this type of life, but only by victimising others. The victims came from this same marginalised and often forgotten part of the population, and, using his accomplices' local knowledge, it was not difficult to find a steady stream of vulnerable children who were lured to Iqbal's apartment. Many of the victims were targeted at the Hira Mandi Bazaar and the Dutta Dabar Shrine, both in Lahore. The children would be lured to Iqbal's property and, when inside, he would rape them, strangle them with a chain and then dismember them, with the piece of their body then being dissolved in vats of acid. The remnants of these bodies would then be dumped, likely by being poured down a drain. The youngest victim was six years old, the oldest, 16. Iqbal would take the children's clothes and shoes and label them, often using a photo he had taken of the children just prior to his murder. This was his collection of trophies. I've struggled to find information on Iqbal's victims, but I have found information about two brothers, although the name of only one is mentioned, and neither's age is documented. One of these brothers escaped with his life, the other tragically did not, and their story gives an idea of how the gang operated to lure children into Iqbal's clutches. In October 1999, Ijaz Muhammad, lovingly known as Kaka by his family, and his older brother went out to try and make money. They were both masseurs and would walk the streets hanging out in parks, clinking together bottles of ointment in the hopes of attracting customers which, as already outlined, would usually be paedophilic men. Kaka's brothers said they were in the park in Lahore when they were approached by two boys not much older than them. They told them, quote, our boss needs a massage and he'll pay you double the price if you come with us. The brothers followed the pair until they were outside Iqbal's property. Kaka was told to go inside as the boss, Iqbal, was waiting to speak to him. Kaka's brother then left to try and find other customers. Kaka was never seen alive again. How many children Iqbal actually killed is disputed and I'll return to this later. But regardless of the true number, it's clear that he was a prolific child murderer and none of his crimes were noticed until he himself confessed, which he actually had to do twice before anyone actually bothered to do anything about it. In November 1999, a letter was received by Lahore Police Station, which was a confession, with the author stating they had killed 100 boys. A few officers went to the address on the note, Iqbal's home, and knocked on the door. When he answered, he was agitated and abusive, and at one point, pulled out a gun and began threatening the officers, saying he would shoot himself if they didn't leave him alone. So, what did they do in this situation? Did they bundle him to the floor, arrest him, and search the property? No, they simply walked away. In December 1999, Javed Iqbal mailed the same letter, along with dozens of pictures of boys he'd murdered, to the offices of Jang, Pakistan's most popular Urdu language newspaper. This landed on the desk of the editor, Jamal Chisti, who later stated, quote, After going through the contents of the envelope, I thought there could be two possibilities. Either someone was trying to frame him, or this man has really done it. Jamil and a colleague took it upon themselves to investigate, and they, like the police a month before, went to Iqbal's property. It was abandoned and padlocked. The two journalists scaled an outside wall in order to gain entry. What they found inside was like something out of a nightmare. They saw bloodstains all over the floor and walls, and noticed blood on a chain, the same one used to strangle the victims. There were sacks scattered around the floor, as well as a journal, with placards neatly pinned to the wall explaining what they found like some sick museum exhibit. One placard read, quote, The five sacks lying in one corner of this room contain the clothes of a hundred victims, while the remaining three contain 85 pairs of shoes belonging to them. All details of the murders are contained in the diary and the 32-page notebook that have been placed in the room. This is my confessional statement. Another read, quote, I've decided to commit suicide. There was a distinct smell of decomposition, which seemed to be emanating from two barrels in the property. One of these was opened, and found to contain human body parts which had been dissolved. Later it would be determined that the barrels contained a human torso, 
as well as two feet amputated at the ankle. They were determined to be the remains of three different children who had been dead for some time. A placard on the wall near the barrel stated, quote, The bodies in this room have deliberately not been disposed of, so that the authorities will find them after my suicide. Also found in the property were bags and bags of human hair, clearly taken from the heads of the victims due to how long this would take to dissolve in acid. This point, and the whole setup, indicates that Iqbal had set up a production line of murder and dismemberment, with him having researched every aspect of how to achieve his horrific objective of killing a hundred boys as quickly as possible. It appears that he achieved this in approximately 12 months. Jamil and his colleague began investigating what they'd found. Using the notebook they'd recovered, they were able to contact the families of children Iqbal had claimed to have murdered, and they were able to establish that these children had indeed disappeared. On December the 3rd, 1999, the story was published on the front page, under the headline, quote, Claim of murder of 100 kids, with 57 pictures of the murdered children being published on the front page, many of them smiling, not knowing about their impending horrific fate. Publication of this story caused understandable chaos and parents of missing children descended on the area, clutching photographs of their babies. Then, and only then, did the police actually do anything. They recovered the barrels from the property and sent them off for examination. They also collected all the shoes and clothing and laid them out in an evidence room whilst grieving parents had to pour through these piles looking for items belonging to their children. Absolutely horrific. The police then began looking for Iqbal and his accomplices. His four accomplices were found first, having been arrested when they tried to cash a stolen traveller's cheque. However, whilst in custody, one of these, Mohammed Ishak, apparently committed suicide by jumping out of a window whilst being questioned. From what I've read, suspects of particularly heinous crimes having accidents or committing suicide were quite common in this part of the world at this time and was a poor attempt to cover up when these people were murdered or assisted out of the window by being thrown. Iqbal was nowhere to be found, but the police didn't have to look for him for long. On the 30th of December 1999, Javid Iqbal walked into the newspaper office of Jang and gave himself up. At the time, legal proceedings in Pakistan were usually held behind closed doors, but the court case against Javid Iqbal and his accomplices was widely covered by the cameras. Despite his confession, it's clear that Iqbal wanted things on his terms. He wanted attention and praise for what he'd done, but he didn't want to suffer the consequences of his actions. And so, despite writing a 30 plus page confession and leaving signs above all of the evidence, he claimed he was innocent of the offences. His claims were laughable. On one occasion, he said his confession about killing a hundred boys was simply to bring attention to the plight of Pakistan's impoverished child population. Seriously? I mean, I don't even know where to start with that one. He also claimed that despite the remains found in the barrels in his home being identified as human bodies, the dismembered remains of children, he claimed they were simply full of beef and other meat as a way to confuse the police. Iqbal made long rambling statements in court which made little sense, including him saying, quote, I was considered an insane person, but I beg that my viewpoint must also be heard. I considered myself a culprit because I have been made a culprit by police. So I think what he's saying here is that he confessed the crimes because the police told him he was the one responsible. Right. Inevitably, Iqbal and his accomplices were found guilty, and on March the 16th, 2000, stood to be sentenced before Judge Ranja. 13-year-old Mamad Sabir was sentenced to 63 years in prison. 15-year-old Mamad Nadim was sentenced to 182 years in prison. 17-year-old Sajid Ahmad was sentenced to death by hanging. As for Javid Iqbal, he was sentenced to death and then some. The judge ordered that he be strangled publicly in the street in front of the families of his victims. His body would then be cut into a hundred pieces and dissolved in acid, exactly the way he had murdered so many children. 
However, despite this sentence being, in my opinion, quite fitting, it quickly caused an uproar amongst human rights activists and was appealed. It was determined that this sentence was abhorrent and could not be carried out. So, a new sentence date was set for the middle of October 2001, but Javed Iqbal would never attend this. On October the 9th, 2001, both individuals sentenced to death, Javed Iqbal and Sajid Ahmad, were found dead in their respective cells in prison. The official report was that they died by poisoning themselves. However, autopsies of both found they had clear signs of strangulation and a pattern of injury suggesting they'd both been beaten at the time of their deaths and in the weeks and months before. I think it's pretty clear that the prison guards or prisoners, or both, took matters into their own hands with this one, but I'll leave that up to you to decide. Before talking about the profile of Javed Iqbal, and important issues why he was able to get away with this for so long, Iqbal's crimes only came to light when he confessed. He claimed that he could have killed 500 if he wanted to. I think this is true. The police just didn't care. Why is that? Central to this is the inefficiency and corruption in the police, which had an impact on them actually bothering to investigate anything, and the parents of the murdered children even feeling they were able to report their loved ones missing. The reason for this, from my research, was the rampant corruption and extortion happening in the police. Victims' families were scared to go to the authorities, for fear they would be shaken down and what little they had taken from them. They also knew that nothing would be done, as they came from poor families, their problems simply didn't matter. This is why only 25 of the 100 children who went missing were ever reported to the police. This is absolutely disgusting and I pray that the police in Pakistan have changed significantly in the 20 plus years since this horrific case. Before getting into Javed Iqbal's psychology, I want to play a very, very short clip of one of his ramblings, which I think was made to a journalist during an interview. <laughs> ہستی کو بھی نبوس کر دیتا اگر خدا ایک آدمی دو آدمی تین آدمی دس آدمی پندرہ آدمی بیس آدمی خدا کا getting tired of the number of cases I've come across where religion is brought into it. It's either the devil made me do it or God commanded me to do it or in this case but well, if I was doing anything wrong, God would have stopped me. These are all examples of distancing language, shifting the responsibility of what they have done to someone or something else, allowing them to continue to diminish responsibility for their actions. It's clear that by the time that he appeared in court, Iqbal was panicking. I think he was so disconnected from reality that he believed he was justified in what he was doing and that when he announced his killing spree, people would fall in a pile on the floor worship him as a god and he would walk through the streets feared. He'd stuck his middle finger up at society and he expected society to simply back down, having learnt their lesson, don't mess with Javed Iqbal, and then continued on his merry way like he continuing to rape and murder children. I imagine he had fantasies of newspaper interviews, television appearances, where the focus would be on him and his accomplishments, with people fascinated by his genius and the fact that he'd fought back against oppression. That is the only reason why he confessed, to get this recognition, and why he contacted the media and surrendered himself to them. However, when reality hit home, and he realised, hey, people are pretty pissed, he scrambled around looking for some way to wriggle out of this airtight coffin he'd created for himself, and this included claiming that he'd faked everything to send some sort of powerful message to raise awareness about the plight of impoverished children, that one I find particularly pathetic. Iqbal's mindset and his offending shows his profound narcissism and psychopathic personality. He genuinely appeared to think that he was above everyone else and that he should be allowed to rape as many children as he wanted. How dare the police try to stop him? If they arrested him, it was not because he had violated the bodies and minds of these children, it was because no one recognised the genius of him. These children were merely objects for him to use and abuse 
to gain sexual gratification, but then to murder in order to get his own back at a society that had tried to stop his sick sexual behaviour. How many children Javed Iqbal killed is unclear. It seems as though some of the children he claimed to have murdered were later found safe and well, but this only accounted for around four or five of them. Also, around 20 to 30 of the victims have never been identified from their photos, which is heartbreaking, as these were likely children who had no one, and so, when they died, there was no one to even notice or search for them. However, around 70 of the children in the pictures were identified, and they have never returned home. So the actual total is likely to be somewhere between 70 to 90 plus, which is just a staggering and horrific total, which makes Javid Iqbal one of the most prolific serial killers in modern history. As with other men who consider themselves to be superior, akin to gods, Javid Iqbal was a coward who targeted the most vulnerable in society. I'm not advocating for death to anyone, but I for one do not mourn his passing or have particular negative emotions about the manner of his death. I'm curious to know how many of you have heard of this case before, and if you have or you haven't, what are your thoughts on the case of Javed Iqbal? Please, if anyone from the region can give further information or insight, then go ahead, I'm sure we'd all appreciate it. If you like the content, please like, share and subscribe, also click the join button to become a channel member, or use the thanks button to send a super thanks, which is a one-off donation to support me in keeping the channel going. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.